My name is Tom Canova. I work for Dell down in Austin, Texas, and I'd like today's presentation, this at least this session, to be very much like a conversation. Um, I have a feeling many of us are in the in the same role or very similar roles where we work, and uh, I'll share some of the things that I'm doing, especially in the the realm of dealing with multiple tools and tying them together. And I have a feeling that most of you have dealt or are dealing with this as well. So I hope some of this will be helpful to you, and I, I suspect I may learn some things. I'm sure I will from each of you during the day. Um, as, as we move forward. Um, so it's going to be a fairly simple agenda, the Multiple Tool Technology Challenge, to talk about exactly what is that if you're not familiar with it. Again, I suspect you each are, though possibly in different ways. So I'll, I'll speak to what it means to me and, and my particular role and circumstances right now. Um, what are our ultimate goals in the uh, development automated the automation, build automation space, and some tips and techniques to get there, hopefully be practical, some things that, that maybe you can take away. And again, it'll be a conversation, so if, if we have dialogue as this goes along and you have some things you want to ask as we're getting into it, as I'm talking, that's, that's perfectly fine, and we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end as well. The single vendor paradise. Um, does one vendor do it all? Uh, if you talk to marketing guys from various tools companies, then sometimes you will find one vendor who promises to do it all, and sometimes you'll have a manager that buys into the vision, will buy this product, and everything's done, and development is fast and productive, and quality is there, and, and uh, ultimately, after that purchase is made, it comes back to you or me to figure out how to actually make it productive and, and or add quality to the equation, because one vendor doesn't do it all. Um, and there's a lot of cost with the one vendor solution. Sometimes it can be a very good solution. I'm not, I'm not knocking where you have one vendor that does a lot, but one vendor doesn't do it all. Um, sometimes there's additional upfront cost in terms of licensing and whatnot and consulting costs. There can be long-term implications as well with vendor lock-in um, when you have one vendor that's doing everything. Finding the right tool for the right job. Um, is one of the challenges that we have where I'm at. I'm, I'm actually on a product support team at Dell, and Dell does, a lot of folks think of Dell as the PCs, like what we've got in front of us, and that certainly is a, a cool part of what Dell does. Uh, but we also do things in the server and in the, um, the data center type of space and software for your data centers um, and a variety of types of software. And so I'm, I'm privileged to work for them more in the software capacity than in the hardware capacity. Mm -hmm. And so finding the right tool for us, we, we do a lot with Linux. Um, and finding tools that will work with Windows, with Linux, um, that can be uh, a bit of a challenge. We have one of our tools that we're using is um, TFS. And then finding the right tool for the job, if we're doing Linux types of builds, TFS does have a build capability. It's really not your ideal build type of technology to use for Linux builds, right? So I want to work with TFS, but I also want to do the right thing for our Linux builds, too. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where it comes into play. You can have one vendor that does a lot, but you need to still make smart decisions, right decisions, for getting the right tool for what you're actually doing. Um, some other tools that we're using from, from OBS, OpenSUSE Build Services, and creation of RPMs and appliances. Um, and other things with right tools for the right job. Ideally, as you're bringing in these multiple tools, um, you'll have a loosely coupled type of system to tie them together with. And that's one of the things I think Jenkins gives to us uh, via its plug-in technology, via the extensibility and the things that we can do with the Jenkins. It can be somewhat loosely coupled. You don't have to have every tool knowing everything about the other tools in your tool set. Um, if you've got just a little bit of uh, programmer grease to add to the equation, you can tie these things together. So in terms of legacy, inherited tools and experience, if you're like me, um, you come into a situation and it's not Greenfield where everything's brand new and you can select exactly which technologies that you want to use. So in my situation, um, we have a, a product, a new product that we're building that we're actually leveraging some things from an old product. So you think it's a new product, it's Greenfield, but no, we want to reuse and leverage. And so with that old product comes some old um, technology and technologies and tools that we wanted to leverage. So we're using AMP, and I've used AMP for many years, and, and that's fine, and it's good. Um, we're using Maven, using shell scripts, using a number of homegrown things as well. Um, and so that's part of the challenge with the multiple tool technology challenge, is some of the legacy things. It's not always your choice to choose just the ideal tools for a situation. You also need to work with 
uh, with what you've got a lot of times. So some of the technologies in our, in our stack, again, um, I think most of us in here have probably worked with Ant and with Maven. Um, Gradle, and I saw that mentioned in the earlier presentation. It's really cool. It's been fun um, getting to know Gradle for me. Um, I started with Dell last summer and really have been immersed into Jenkins and these these different tools you see up, up here since then. Um, it's been, been a lot of fun. Uh, Microsoft TFS is one of our tools. Again, I mentioned we're using that for uh, requirements and for bug tracking. Uh, Subversion, and our developers love Subversion. You know, gets great. There's a lot of great source code management tools. We happen to be using Subversion. Um, source code analysis type of tooling, you probably have some of that in your, your build automation. We're using Fortify from a security standpoint, which also includes some integration with find bugs. Um, OpenSUSE built services, again, we're using that for um, some of our RPM creation types of things, appliance creation, uh, VMs, that sort of thing. Uh, various VMware products, so we, we are working, um, particularly in, in the build automation space of VMware products, uh, from a build verification test as we, we're creating as our product, we're creating appliances, we can push up that appliance onto a VMware instance and go run a series of tests against it. Um, and then Linux shell scripts, yum, um, just a, a whole host of other things with that. We have a, a script, and I'm, I'm really blessed to have a, a testing team that also has automation. A lot of times you find testers have automation expertise as well, and we're kind of partnered, and they have a what they call auto QA. They have a framework that they've built, a Java framework, for, for managing their regression tests. And I actually found a way to leverage that for a build automation, for a build verification test. So we, we've tied that into the, the loop. Uh, things like SOAP UI, um, Nexus. I don't have Nexus listed up here, but uh, some of you are probably using Artifact or your Nexus for some of your um, dependency management types of things. Um, Apache Carafe, some of you may be doing OSGI types of work um, as well. So there's lot, lots of tools out there. Those are some of the ones that, that I'm involved with. And again, if each of you came up here, you probably have a list of 12, 20, maybe 30 tools that also that you have to make work in your environment. So what is the ultimate goal? And so this is where I, I try to keep, automation is fun, programming is fun, and I could get busy and involved in automating all kinds of things just because they're cool, kind of from a scientist's point of view. But all, at the end of the day, I'm an engineer. and, and, and really part of my job is to enhance productivity and quality in the product that's being developed. And so as, as I go about the task of automating with Jenkins and tying these tools together, if I don't have some goal in mind that's, that has to do with improving productivity, improving quality, um, if it's just I want to tie these together because I'd like them to be tied together, that in and of itself really isn't enough. And usually you can find reasons for productivity and quality and that can help guide um, the work that you do. One of the fun things I think in our space is that as we do work, it's not as rigid in terms of the set of requirements that are fed to you. You know what needs to be done as productivity and quality, but you get a fair amount of flex flexibility in setting those requirements. How do you achieve that? And so that, that becomes a, uh, a gauge, if you will, a way of, of guiding you and making good decisions for the things that you're working on and automating and spending your time on. Uh, so, so with, with automation, limiting manual task um, to really the creative task. So, none of us like doing the tedious things. Or developers don't like doing the tedious things, and we t those tend to be error prone. If there's things that are manual that can be automated, so we, we automate those. That helps productivity and quality, and and then it enables us really. We enjoy our task and our job more if we're doing the creative thing. So, really, at the end of the day, that that gives us more more fun in, in the job. Um, other things with delivering productivity and quality is communication is key in what we're doing. And communication, and we'll talk about this later, is more than just giving out the URL to your Jenkins server. There's, there's more to it. Um, and supporting quality through repeatability, your automated testing, automated code analysis, and this list could probably go on and on. The kinds of things you can do um, really to make the quality of your product better. Um, so tips and techniques, and this is kind of another drill down agenda, but we'll talk about testing first and what that means to me and what I'm doing and, and what it can mean to all of us. Um, Jenkins plugins and their role. Taking Jenkins further with Groovy is something that I've done this last year. And um, 
yeah, again, Groovy's been a lot of fun. Loosely coupled jobs. And what do I mean by that? Effective communication. Let's drill down into some, some real examples of where I think we've taken some steps to try to make the communication more effective and useful um, to our development community. And then reusability and maintainability tips. So first, with testing outside of Jenkins, um, scripts are software. And so you find yourselves as the, the automation engineer at your location actually writing software. And if you're writing software, not only are you running other people's tests, you really need to be testing the stuff that you're doing and have ways of testing that. Um, so one of the things to do as you're writing software is to include tests I mean, writing scripts, include test data, include some way of actually testing your scripts. So somebody who comes after you, because you're not going to be there you know, five years, ten years from now, somebody will come along and need to be able to support this stuff. And if you've got test data in that, where they test data associated with some of your more advanced scripts, where they can test it, um, it really becomes quite helpful in a number of ways. It helps with maintenance. Um, so they, somebody goes and changes something to their script, they can run the test again, they've got some, some stubbed out data or something they can use to, to run a test to make sure they have a break in some of the things in your scripts. It helps with documentation on usage. Um, one of the things, if you're like me, that I like when I'm trying to use a new tool or a new script is to see how do I use it. If I can see an example of how it's used, that, that gives me an immediate jump start on using that. So if you've got usage with your test, people can see, oh, this is how the script is used, and they can go set up Jenkins or set up something else to, to reuse that script. Um, and, and obviously with documentation, it's self-documenting. Um, testing outside of Jenkins can also be valuable. And so what, what I've got an example here in this screenshot is um, you've got on the left is a Gradle script, a snippet from a Gradle script. And... Um, it's actually got, it checks for property. If I run this Gradle script from the command line and just pass it the property test, it will go through and set up my test data for me. Since I'm running outside of Jenkins, um, I don't have like the SVN URL and SVN revision type of parameters provided for me from Jenkins. So I just, I push that data into the environment so I can go ahead and run the test uh, from the command line. And then on the right side, you can get the idea of the uh, and the kinds of output that you can get from that. And so we're actually running our Jenkins on a, on a Linux host, or our master's um, node, at least it's on a Linux host. We have some Windows nodes as well. And uh, this just makes the, the turnaround time as well as you're developing some of these specialized scripts and, and plugins and whatnot a little bit quicker to be able to quickly <coughs> run things again and again and try different things out. And especially if you found situations with data that actually causes problems for your scripts and you've worked around that, you can include that as part of your testing. Uh, one of the other things that I like to do with testing is to have a sandbox. And so that's actually within Jenkins. So not only do you want to test outside of Jenkins, you want to test with, within Jenkins without actually testing on your live jobs that are uh, everybody's depending on. And so for, for us, what a sandbox means is in addition, you've got the, the sandbox view with your sandbox jobs and Jenkins, but we have a different branch in Subversion. Um, so I can go uh, think with the different stuff in there that, that might be impacted. And, and not only is it used by me for doing sandbox tests on my scripts, we can also use it for developers that are doing disruptive types of work. Um, I use a different repository in terms of binary repository. For us, again, Nexus is our, our binary repository and dependency management repository, because I can use a different one of those. Um, it's, it's really useful not only for, again, not only for testing my changes, for, for testing disruptive changes. Um, so we have other groups that will introduce a new RPM into, a, into the build process. And it may be something that is suspect, it's coming from another internal team that we depend on and we don't want to immediately just introduce it into the trunk. So not only can I use a sandbox for our own test and our own scripts, if somebody's introducing something new or something new I need to script around, we can do that work and get it stable in the sandbox and then push it back into the trunk. Um, it's also useful from a sandbox perspective to use a slave um, node. So if you do have um, some test load types of situations from a performance perspective, you don't want to impact others you push it off to a different node um, in your build setup. 
it also keeps your trunk dashboard clean. So if, if you have folks that are regularly monitoring your, your dashboard in Jenkins and looking for the green or the blue um, icons, it's not all cluttered with red from the, the stuff that you're playing around with um, in the sandbox. So you kind of keep that isolated as well. So in terms of tying the, the multiple tools together, you're going to have to write some scripts. You're going to have to write some, um, perhaps even plugins. And, and plugins, before you even start writing, the answer the question is: Is there a plugin out there that can do this? And uh, I think most of us, that's one of the reasons we use Jenkins, is because we've got so many plugins. Is you know, it gets you a jump start ahead that the community has provided all of these things, and it just is common sense to go out and leverage what's already been done rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, obviously, the, the plugins are community supported, so you're benefiting um, from that, from the community testing as well. Um, it's less likely to, to be as fragile as if you write something yourself. Um, it might not evolve to exactly what you need, maybe you know, as fast as you want, if you have a very specialized need. But if you can find a plugin that gets you most of the way there and you can use it, then definitely that, that's where you start. So, some of the plugins that we're using. Um, Again, if you're using Maven, you're probably using the Maven plugin. We're using the Copy Artifact plugin. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Email extension plugin. Um, how many folks in here are using the email EXT plugin? Okay, it's definitely worth taking taking a look at. Um, it gives you some powerful options for customizing your your emails that go out. And we'll take a little bit closer look at what we're doing with that plugin uh, later on. You see some of the emails that, that we actually send out. Uh, parameterized trigger plugin. Again, as you're writing um, scripts and customizing things, parameterizing the work you do is so important. So not only as a developer, you don't want to hard code things. As a build automation engineer, you want to avoid hard coding. It just makes it easier to reuse things if you need to branch and create a copy of a set of uh, jobs. If they're parameterized, it's so much easier to get that done or to pass it on to another build engineer for them to reuse the work that you've done. Um, Gradle plugin, and again, I'll we'll show you a little bit more on Gradle later. Jenkins Text Finder plugin. So rather than writing custom stuff to say this job, you know, to check the logs to say, you know, there's an error here, we need to flag this as, as failed, um, just use the Jenkins Text Finder. You can do a lot of stuff with um, Jenkins Text Finder. It uses regular expressions to go through your logs and uh, to change the status on your builds. Um, so it can save some unnecessary coding work on your, on your part by just leveraging that. Granted, yeah. backup plugin. And that, that's something I'm, um, I guess, spoiled in the sense that where I'm working, we've got another team that administers um, some of the, the underpinnings of Jenkins behind the scenes for me. So I'm, I'm welcome to set up and deploy new versions of Jenkins, but if I want to be in the long term stable release, they'll manage that for me. They manage backups of the configuration. So they actually added that to my Jenkins instance because I handled it the backups. So um, definitely it's, it's worthwhile to make sure you've got your stuff backed up. So taking Jenkins further with Groovy, when, when existing plugins won't do it all. So again, as you, as you look at the tool sets that you're working with, you may not find a plugin that does quite what you need to do. And in our case, where we're dealing with TFS and Subversion, um, there are some plugins for TFS and some plugins for Subversion, but plugins to do what we wanted to with those two tools together just weren't there. Um, so there's scenarios uh, also that aren't necessarily ideal for plugins. So, so plugins can fit into your, your build lifecycle in a very predictable manner and very useful way. But some things you want to do as an automation engineer maybe aren't ideal in that, in, in that sort of approach. So if you've done ant work, maybe it's more appropriate to have some scripting that's um, task-oriented, where you've got different targets or tasks that need to do things, and you can rearrange them in, in different ways quite easily if you were done with ant. Or with Gradle, some, some of the similar concepts apply. Um, so one of the things is you, is you choose a language to do some custom development for, and if you're leveraging Jenkins, it's useful to find a language that uh, works well with Jenkins out of the box. And there, there's probably multiple, but two of the ones that, that appeared to me as I was looking at this and deciding on which language to use were Groovy and Ruby. 
And I think there's a talk later on Ruby. I'm not as familiar with Ruby in, in background. I, I grew up, um, well, before Java, I started development before that, but I spent a lot of time on Java, started in the 90s. So I was really comfortable with the Java world. So, and Groovy just makes Java that much easier. Um, so those are the two things that, that they tie into your Java ecosystem. So if there's other things from the Java world that you want to use with Groovy, you can do that. Um, if you have Java expertise or if you have developers with Java expertise, the things that you're doing, if somebody has to come along and maintain and support them later, uh, they'll be able to leverage that expertise and, and there won't be a big learning curve to support the things that you're doing. Um, and then Gradle, um, how many folks have actually used Gradle just to get an idea? Got a couple folks, okay. So uh, it's, it's always fun to talk to family who are non-technology people to say, I'm using Gradle and I'm using Groovy and they think, oh, that's pretty interesting stuff, what is that? And uh, Groovy, uh, for folks who haven't used it, if, if you've used Java, Groovy adds a layer of stuff on top of Java. It's official part of the Java platform. And it's added to a number of other functions and enables you really to script in Java. If you try to just write a script in Java directly, it's a kind of a pain um, to set up the classes and the, the static main class and everything else. It's a lot easier in Groovy and Groovy gives you utilities to deal with XML and a number of other things so to make it really easy like you're working with a real scripting language. Groovy supports the notion of domain specific languages which is the, the DSL acronym up there. <coughs> And, and so one of the domain specific languages is Gradle. So Gradle is a build specific domain specific language that includes some of the conventions like you get in a Maven um, where you have some of the things you get with Anna. So from a Maven perspective, perspective, a lot of folks go to Maven because of dependency, um, dependency management. Um, Gradle gives you dependency management. But Gradle doesn't tie your hands by convention as much as Maven does. A lot of people complain about Maven. If you want to do anything that's a little bit different than the convention, then it's like trying to you know, fight your way out of prison to get that done. And it can be difficult. Um, Gradle, on the other hand, it actually includes Ant under the covers. You can run an Ant build script directly from Gradle. But you can also have these conventions that you follow, like a, like a Maven-style thing to resolve dependencies. It can resolve things from a Nexus repository, for example. Um, so for us, Gradle is a really compelling, because I've got developers who are using Ant, developers who are using Mabel, M M Maven. Um, so what is that natural bridge between the two? And, and for me, it looks like Gradle's going to be that bridge. I haven't moved developers onto Gradle yet, but there's things I can do with Gradle because it's got Groovy directly in Jenkins today and kind of planning for the future, thinking here's a technology that not only helps me as a, a build automation guy, this could also be something that helps our developers down the road. And there's some, some important com companies that are also using Gradle if you go on their site and see from what really got me was LinkedIn. Um, I saw that they were using, they'd gone from Ant to Maven and now to Gradle. I was like, okay, that's a... That's a pretty good, uh, pretty important company that's putting important things on, onto that technology. And so the Jenkins API also, you've got access through Groovy and I think through Ruby as well into the Jenkins API um, to get data out and to do things. So let me take you through a case study um, with the, uh, from a traceability point of view for, for one of my challenges I had with the multiple tools. So first of all, traceability, let me, I've kind of been around this traceability term for a while now. And, and the idea with traceability is wanting to take the requirements that somebody has given to your software development team and tie those requirements to a variety of things. You want to trace those requirements, among other things, to the code changes that are happening. You want to tie those requirements to the builds that they're included in. Um, and it becomes real important um, to have those ties there. Your testers want to know, well, there's a new build out, what's in it? And not only what's in it in terms of files that are in it, but what's in it in terms of, of bugs that have been fixed or requirements that have been implemented. So that's the idea of traceability, is, is again, tying these code changes back to your requirements and tying them into the builds. And so for us, we have, we really have three different tools in play here. We've got the subversion is where the code changes were happening and commit messages and all that. Um, and then we have TFS for both our defect and our requirements, which is really the, the things that are driving the work that's happening. And then we have Jenkins actually running the build, so it knows when the build's completed and 
and various kinds of build metadata. So out of the subversion, um, re really the key thing you're getting from there is both commit comments. So there may be additional tips and things that developers are commenting on about why they changed, what they changed. Um, as well as a list of files that have changed. And so we're really, that's, we want those two pieces of information as part of this traceability um, solution. From TFS, uh, really the key thing is the work item title. Um, there's other information about the work item that you can go into TFS and get you know, work item ID, work item title are really key there. And then out of Jenkins, um, your build name, your build number, the build time that it occurred. As you take those together, then you're, you're pushing all that information now that it's tied together, it's traced, it's related. Um, really into two places for us. And one is we push it into the TFS, back to TFS, and, uh, which has a, a history field in every work item, or whether it's a defect work item or requirement work item. It always has this history field, so we can push each time we do a build um, information about what was built in terms of the commits and the files and the build time and, and all of that into the related um, work items in TFS and the history field. And the other, other place that we're pushing this to is in, in build notifications. And the idea there is, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's kind of instant consumption and, and sending emails out. So I'll take a drill down just a little bit more on um, the subversion commit comments. And, and something I'd like to, to note here is as you're integrating things together, if you're going to require other people to do things for your thing to work, um, simplicity is key. I mean, you, you can do a lot of work on your end um, to make it simple for others. And so one of the things that we've done is to make it simple for developers to, to make this traceability work and try to give them something as a reward is all they need to do to include in their commit comments is include TFS ID and the ID number. And then they can put whatever else they want in their comments. And we have other, other standards for templates where you know, your chain summary reviewed by what's it tested by and then TFS ID. Um, you can actually, if you're in subversion, you can force certain things to be in your commit comments if, if that's your inclination. Or you can leave it a little more open if you're in an early stage of a project and you, do, you don't want to be as strict on it. So you're going to see here where we're not being as strict. We're not necessarily forcing it. Um, but one of the things we do to encourage and prod this, you, you'll see in a moment as well. So if the developers put the TFS ID into their, in their comments like you see here, and you see you know, three different revisions, I um, actually see two with it and one without, then we give them in return. We'll, take, we'll, we'll pull that TFS work item title out of TFS when we go and publish the build notification. So they don't have to go and copy and paste that in there. They just type in the ID number and that's actually, a lot of times they know what they're working on and they've got that up in the other window. It's just quick to type an ID and it saves them time from typing. So we try to make it simple and some sort of reward to them as well. Um, the other place or place in terms of publishing is a TFS history. And so one of the things I like about whether it's source control or, or something like a, a tool that's managing your requirements um, is traceability and having that long running record of what happened, when, and why. And so TFS really gives you that. Um, so you can go back and you can see which builds was this included and was this included in the build on branch A or branch B. You may have multiple builds for a given change as it progresses up a, a hierarchy of uh, a promotion hierarchy. And you can see as it's made it into the CI build, now it's made it into the integration build or the appliance build. And so that can then be reflected back into TFS. So you have some sort of audit trail. Um, and you also see in, in this example where you get the subversion revision information, the author. Um, I think I've doctored these up pretty good. They, one of the things that I had to do, because I'm not working for a vendor that's just doing a dummy scenario, this is from real data. I had to. Uh, to take out last names so you wouldn't email all of my colleagues asking them to come work for you. So you'll just see first names here and take out any key keywords. But um, you see the author, JF, um, commit messages, um, the files changed are there as well. So it's pulling the, the different stuff from Subversion and pushing it that was pushing it there. You see the, the build number and the build time as well. 
Um, and then the email, what does the email look like? And so uh, really the, the section of this email that's, that's key is where it says the version change is traced to TFS work item is in, in black and underlined. There's really an HTML fragment that I'm producing as I'm tying these three things together. And then I use that e email EXT plugin to build the rest of the email around that. And I suck in the HTML that has the traceability in it. Um, so it includes, again, the, the title from the TFS IDs, um, some version revision information, files changed, commit messages. Um, and again, it's kind of embedded in the, the rest of this email that I've put together uh, related to the build notifications. And I found as much as I hate the volume of email that I get, and you probably do as well, that is still the thing that people use the most. Um, I've tried giving out the URL for Jenkins. You know, it's in my na naive in the early days in doing this, I, you know, put the, the URL for Jenkins and people can go get all this information if they go click around the, the, the site there. Um, even including the things like you see at the top, you know, I've got a direct link now to the build console log. I, I don't just put a link to Jenkins because people might click on that and then they don't know where to go to find the console log or to find um, various types of things that, that are available to them. And so I find that you know, email is still essential. There's not a shortcut for actually getting really valuable information in email. Don't you don't want to just push a ton of stuff into email because that you know if, if you're like me, you read the first couple lines. If you don't see what you need, you're you're probably moving on. You want to put really valuable stuff that folks can use in there. Um, so so loosely coupled jobs. Um, so we're using CI jobs as well as other types of jobs. Um, we have an, a, an appliance build again. So we have a CI job, and the goal on that is to get some feedback to your developers, ideally within 10 minutes of them doing a commit. Um, if you call a job that runs for an hour a CI job, it's really not completely um, doing the things that you want a CI job to do. Ideally, with your continuous integration builds, you want to get feedback to that developer before they move on to the next thing that they're doing, before they head to lunch, um, that they get quick feedback and they get in a habit of checking, did my, did my build pass? So we have the, the CI jobs that are those quick running types of builds and they have lightweight unit tests, not integration tests that are going and hitting databases and, and doing a lot of you know, heavy, heavy lifting types of things, but true unit tests that are testing the APIs on your different classes and things. You can still use integration tests and do that as another step. Um, so we have multiple steps, and as we build appliances, you have kind of the CI step, and we kind of redo that again, but then we're passing things off to go and, and build RPMs, and build um, VMXs and VMs, and go and do build verification tests. We have a two hour turnaround, um, that's kind of the window that we give us a maximum for our appliance builds. So it's, it's, a, it's a longer running type of test. Um, and we actually divide that up into kind of four pieces that, that work together. Um, they were talking about workflow earlier. And so workflow is something that we're kind of using along the way to make that happen. If we need to restart from the middle of the workflow, we can do that by having the multiple jobs. But as you're using multiple jobs, it's, it's the natural first to want to hard code. This job automatically talks to this job, and you start having hard-coded terms in your job configurations. Um, would encourage you as much as you can to have those loosely coupled and to not be dependent on having to be on a specific node. Um, it helps with parallelism you know, to be able to farm this out to one of many nodes so you don't get a bottleneck in your, in your build chain. And that also helps for, for reuse types of purposes. And if you have a large job that's, you know, the job itself is running for two hours, there's a good chance you can probably refactor that into, into multiple steps and relating those steps in some sort of workflow. And again, that, that's what we've done. One of the one of the plugins that we're using with the refactoring um, is a copy artifacts plugin. So there's different things from um, that the Jenkins can actually do with the artifacts you produce. And so one of the things that that we've got is we've we've produced um, these tar GZ files out of the CI, and we've done our CI work and ready to go do some RPM work. Rather than go and access the version again. Um, which is a little bit unreliable because now it's a few minutes later. We take the output of the first job, we make it available to the next, but we don't have to run on the same node. We can use the copy artifacts plugin to take the tar GZ produced by the first and hand it off to the next step in this build chain, this build workflow. And so if 
certain plugins like this can make it really helpful to to divide up your huge jobs into smaller jobs that, that are reusable and can be parallelized across multiple nodes. Um, effective communication. So, so I mentioned this earlier. Jenkins is nice, but um, the primary people that I find using Jenkins are myself and, and a couple other build engineers. From time to time, you'll get a developer that goes out there and doesn't quite know what to do in our organization. I mean, developers are smart, but they're really their mind is drilled down in other areas besides figuring out how the Jenkins interface is laid out. And so um, I find the Jenkins interface is really valuable to me and it's really important to me having the web interface, but I don't rely on the Jenkins interface for providing important information to my developers. So effective communication, one of the, the key things about it is timely information delivery. Uh, we were talking about the traceability um, things that we were solving with TFS and Subversion. Having the information about the files that were changed and the commit messages and the TFS work items that were done at the time of commit is really not the right time because that's not the time you can actually do anything with it. The time when you need that information is when a build has happened and you actually have a built uh, product, whether it be an ear or in our case a VM uh, or something that the test team can do something with, that the management can know, oh, this is actually in this build. So, so being timely to provide this information, provide information too early, the people <coughs> spend a lot of cycles waiting to see, well, when is that build actually done? And that's unnecessary time wasted. So really finding the right time to deliver the information. And, and quite often the, when these builds complete is the ideal time. And making the information consumable. So uh, yeah, we're, we're using the, the email EXT plugin, which is great. And... Again, you see the different links at the top. So you can actually get the, the, to the build homepage for that particular build in Jenkins if you click on the first link. So if I, if I have somebody who really wants to get there, uh, I didn't put the whole URL in there because that's kind of wasting real estate. And again, if you want to get as much as you can in the first couple lines of email messages for people to really consume it. If you're wasting it with long URLs, then they're not going to get to the important information. So uh, email extension, no, plug-in where you get the little A and href type of tags on there to shorten that. Um, get directly to the appliance files that I've produced to the build console log. Um, we have console logs that we're creating the RPMs and appliance. In addition, you can get directly to those. Um, the BBT type of output. And I, I clarify acronyms here because I know they're different between organizations. For us, BBT is build verification test. So. As you're running tests to, to verify that what you've done is, is legitimate, you might call it a smoke test. Um, when those tests fail and you fail your, your Jenkins job, you want to have a way um, for your developers and for yourself as build automation type of engineer to get in there and figure out what's going on, what broke. Um, ideally, 90% of the time, it should be something that the developers change that broke it. But there will be times that things happen in the infrastructure that it could be something that you need to go in and look into as well. Um, and so having direct access to those logs, not only the logs from it running from an external standpoint, but those internal logs for us, you get the logs where we're running SOAP UI tests and other types of tests and the responses that we're getting back. But we also have the logs from within the server. So whether it be, let's say, Tomcat logs or PostgreSQL logs or whatever, um, and pulling those out and making those easily available. Um, prior to having this in there, you'd have to go start up the appliance again and go manually log in and, and look at the logs and it would take you know, five, ten, ten minutes longer to get something done. This makes it more consumable where they can quickly get to it. We've got those archived where they're easy to get to. And then the last thing to note on the effect of communication is with the, um, um, with the files that have been changed, um, we actually have made that link um, clickable. So you've got within Jenkins the ability to, to tie into um, some of your source control types of tools that provide a web interface to, to diffs. And so we've got that active where we've got the, the tool that provides our diffs for changes that have happened. And um, so under the covers, again, this is using the A and the href tag so you don't see all the junk with the revision IDs on it. But under the covers for this, this actually goes to the, the revision comparison and you can see exactly which lines changed. So again, this makes it very useful from a developer point of view. So if they've got a broken build, um, could be a compile issue, could be a BBT issue, they can go quickly look and see what lines have changed in my code. 
and again, the you want to get into that pattern in your organization where everybody expects to have clean builds, and if they don't have a clean build, they're getting on it right away. And we want to make it as easy as possible to, to get working on it right away to retain, return that to a clean state. I worked in an organization prior to Dell where they didn't have any clean builds for months. And once you start that pattern, it's very hard to break, and it takes a lot of time and commitment to actually get past that. So you want to get to that state where you know you have clean builds, and you want to do things with your communication to help. Um, so one one other note is on the email ext plugin um, that we're using with this is that does use um, it's kind of like a JSP type of syntax where you can actually create templates in it, and you can use groovy types of code as little scriptlets inside of, of those templates. So it's pretty powerful, the things you can do with the email EXT plugin, in addition to, to what I talked about with doing Gradle, but there's other groovy types of things that really help you to, to do more if you have special customized things you need to do. Um, targeting multiple platforms. For us, I, I did the initial work on our scripts um, on Windows, but as soon as you go to Linux and you find out, oh, the backslashes or whatever it may be that, that's not set up quite right, or I've got things hard coded, expecting things. Um, it, it makes you to, to build your code um, that you're writing in scripts more robustly. It makes it more reusable as well. Um, so, in this particular screenshot, again, you, you've got the, the two examples where I'm running the, the test on the Windows platform. And then you've got the actual Jenkins execution of the, the same script. And you could be, you could do the multi-platform testing. You don't have to do it outside of Jenkins because you could do, have a Jenkins Windows node and a Linux node as well. So, so getting other teams to leverage what you do. I, I find that that's really valuable. Um, and so I've got enough, we've got other build automation engineers where I work and I've been able to make this where they could they could use the same Gradle script as well. Um, so a couple of different things that we've gotten because of that. Um, you find parameters where you haven't parameterized things correctly, so it can be reused. You, you discover that and you make your, your stuff more robust. Um, you end up, if you know somebody else is going to use the work you're, you're doing, chances are you're going to spend more time making sure you've done it right. It's just peer pressure type of thing, and that, that tends to be healthy. Um, You'll see the red in this message, and earlier we looked at commit things, and one of them didn't have a TFS ID, and I think this is the actual build from that. And so if our developers now don't include TFS IDs in their commit messages, we do allow them to go without doing that, but it gets highlighted in red in the email that goes out, the name of the developer and the no work item ID. And so it's just a gentle way of nudging. Um, again, you can force folks to include certain things with subversion types of um, triggers, but in our case, we're, we're good enough at just nudging in the right direction, and it seems to be, seems to be working pretty good. Um, and again, if you've got somebody else that's using your code and your scripts and the things that you're automating, you're not the, uh, the bottleneck anymore. You've got multiple people who know how to support it, and that becomes valuable when you want to take vacation. Um, so again, parameterizing is key, so examples of some of our parameters. You have to be careful if you parameterize with build number between different jobs. If you pass it from one job to another, sometimes the actual parameter itself gets passed and it picks up the build number from the other job. So there are some, some workarounds for that that we use. Um, so you see here where it's got appliance build number and it has the, the dollar sign build number in there. That, that enables us to pass the appliance build number to the next job in the, in the workflow without it being reinterpreted. Um, on the next job, but definitely you want to use parameters as you know for, for anything that could be changed and to make it reusable. It makes branching easier when we when we have things more parameterized and I need to set up a new branch. You know we branched off for this release or that release. Um, uses just a matter of tweaking a couple parameters, copying the jobs and tweaking them. You could actually reuse the same jobs, but I like having the job history for the different branches separate. So. Um, to refactor and iterate, um, my in my working style, which I see, it seems like it's a lot of folks, my first pass, I get it done. 
I don't always get it done in the best way. I, you know, I trip over things along the way and hard code some things. I just get it done to prove that it can be done. It's usually not the right way the first pass. So it's your writing scripts. Um, you do need to reiterate one. Re, yeah, you need to iterate, refactor, and iterate. Um, so the question is, when do you do the refactoring? And there's not a, a golden time that, oh, I'm refactoring and do this stuff every Friday. Um, you'll find opportunities where you're, you know, you, you have a window of time to actually make something better. And you just look for those opportunities and do it in the sandbox or wherever, test it out. Um, but do make an make intentional effort to, to do some refactoring on the stuff you're doing. Individual goals. Um, I love automating things. It's a lot of fun. I got into software because I like the creative side of it. Um, I also like being able to take vacations and do other things. So I like things to work, and automation helps with that as well. And also because I tend to be forgetful, it's, it's a better idea instead of me manually doing the same thing again and again, that it's automated. Um, I find that automation can reduce job stress, not necessarily if the automation isn't working well, but it can reduce um, some of your job stress and enables you to get more done with less. Um, I want to keep my job, and so I always try to keep an idea of adding value, so the productivity and quality and adding value with what I'm doing to my uh, with my company and with my group. And there, there's a term called DevOps, Dev Operations, Development Operations, which is kind of the area that we're in between the, writing the first line of source code and development and something actually running in production. DevOps is everything in between that helps it get from that first, that source code into production. Um, if you do this, this job right, it kind of earns you a spot at the table on your project planning teams. Ideally, this wouldn't be an afterthought, I would need to go automate the builds. As you, as you establish a good reputation, they will invite you to the table on planning for projects, including you in upgrades and whatnot, and they, they understand the value that you're adding to the organization. And to keep learning is something that, that I enjoy, and, and the creativity and the, just the best part of the fun. So just along with that, so you know, multiple tools are sometimes a challenge, but they can also be, they can be a blessing and as, you, as you pull things together. Um, can be a lot of fun. So it's been pretty much a monologue. But any any, any questions? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, how do you uh, like uh, separate bills from uh, like a main branch and like a personal feature branches? So I mean, we have an issue where it's I mean somebody just playing with the personal branch and build a thread, but we are like uh, be worried about like the main branch. So, uh, how does the branch so, so the question is how do we separate um, builds from the main branch or the trunk branch from, from other branches um, so, so really it's from a Jenkins point of view you, you can set up your different views your tabs if you will and have your job so we have specific jobs for our sandbox branches really our other branch for where we do a lot of that stuff or we have multiple branches you know, as we do release branches and so we have a tab for each of those and kind of keep those segregated, if you will. But in addition to the Jenkins having its own set of jobs, we have our own, you know, the branch and the source control system. It could mean, and we're using Nexus for a repository, so we actually have a separate Nexus group for each branch. So if we're publishing um, jars and other things up to Nexus, we don't want things published by some sandbox job or somebody's personal job to affect our trunk build. So we actually use different Nexus groups to isolate what they're doing from a publishing point of view. So for us, there's a couple of different pieces in the puzzle with these different tools. And so the idea of a sandbox applies to the source control, to your binary management, Nexus or um, Artifactory. Um, so, so, so in Jenkins, you just create a separate set of jobs for like a profile truck? That's correct, yeah. We have a separate set of jobs. And because they've been parameterized, it's actually fairly easy um, you know, once we copy, because you can copy jobs in Jenkins, the main thing that you're changing is URLs to your source control. Um, maybe a couple things related to your, your Nexus, some of the your Nexus sandbox. There's a couple parameterized things you change, and, and that takes care of you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody.